This lecture will be titled, The Incipiency of the Will. The word incipiency means origination of, a commencement of something. So when we say the incipiency of the will, we mean that because man is made in the image of God who has a free will, he put one into man when he created man. And man has this mysterious ability to originate his own actions apart from any outside or inside influence. He can go against heredity, he can go against training, he can go against everything that's good and right and reasonable and do wrong, or he can come from the most terrible background, yet decide that he wants to do what's right and can get into a right relationship with God through the preaching of the word, the teaching of the word, and having his mind enlightened how how ridiculous, neological, and unphilosophical sin is. Turn from his sin on the Savior and seek him with all his heart and be born again by the Spirit of God. Now there's a verse in Luke, the 13th chapter, the 34th verse, which says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. If ever there is a verse that teaches that man has a free will in the matter of salvation, this is just one of them, but a very, very powerful one. Because God says in the Bible, I'm not willing that any should perish. So if man perishes, it must be because he's willing that he perish. Christ isn't willing. God isn't. The Father isn't willing. And Jesus isn't willing so much that he died so that nobody would perish unless they wanted to. There's also another verse in the New Testament says that the children of this generation are wiser than the children of light. I think that's about the most pathetic verse in the whole New Testament of the words Christ spoke. What he's really saying there is that people of this world in their secular task in preparing for it and studying to get a degree or to be so they can perform certain duties in life, whether it be in medicine science, education, or whatever the field, uh, do great intense studying and penetration. And he's saying in this verse, I just quoted to you, the children of this generation are wiser than the children of light. How many people do you know that will do some real penetrating study and analysis of the Word of God and make it as important in their life as what their secular education was their secular task. And I think what we're going to say tonight to some of you people out there who think you'll never find a subject like the incipiency of the will that can make so much change and so much good effect upon your life if you will understand what it means and then put it into effect in your life. There are about 4,000 verses in the Bible indicating man is born with a free will. Yet there are theologies that have been around since the 16th century that teach that man in salvation doesn't have a free will. In fact, they'll say he's dead in trespasses and sins and he can't even repent, so they make repentance optional or subsequent to salvation and optional, and I'm afraid not many of those people pick up the option after they're converted. And it seems to be a wasted effort after that. Now, I find in the study of revivals in our country, the great revivals that we had in the 17th and 18th, 19th century, there was a phrase that was the secret of these revivals. And that phrase was the incipiency of the will. Very common phrase. And it simply means that man has this mysterious ability to originate his own acts 
apart from any outside or inside influence, that he can say no to a good influence, he can say yes to a good influence, but it is up to him. Man can be influenced to sin, but he cannot be caused to sin. But you see, you can say no to an influence, or you can say yes to an influence. And Jesus is here saying, is saying, how often would I have gathered you to me as I hadn't gathered their chicks? Yet there are some people who think that the way people are saved, God predestined this one to be saved, and this one to be lost millions of years before they ever lived. Now that is anti-scriptural in any way you cut it because Peter said, I would beseech you, brethren, to make your calling and election sure. Now if election is all up to God, then what are we doing making it sure? But really the word election in the scriptures does not have to do with salvation. It has to do with being elected by God to special services. In John 15, Jesus said to his disciples and his apostles, he said, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you. Now, that is not referring to salvation. He says, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you or appointed you to go forth and bear much fruit. He's talking now, I'm appointed you, I have elected you to be an apostle, you to be a disciple, but both of them are Christians. One is not there for been decided that God was going to save him billions and millions of years ago, and this one also, but the other people out there, no. My Bible says God is no respecter of persons. Even Paul, speaking later to King Agrippa, he said, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Speaking of when Christ met him, struck him blind. Look out, you don't ask for too much light, friend, because God gave him enough to blind him. I know I'm mixing physical there with spiritual, but when we talk about light, uh, you probably have enough light right now to get converted if you would decide that you're going to turn from your sin. You're going to live up to what little light that you have and trust Christ with all your heart and be born again by the Spirit of God and then obey what little light you have. Not to get to heaven, but because the gratitude to Christ dying for you upon the cross. Now let me show you what I mean by man deciding like this. I have a missionary friend. He was a young lad in Albuquerque, New Mexico. His father was what they call an Anglo. His mother was Mexican. He was in high school, about a junior in high school, when he took an inventory of his life. And he looked around at all these boyhood friends he's raised with, and he's the only one left that wasn't in a penitentiary, a reform school, or been electrocuted, or hung. He's the only one left. He said, now I could see I was going in the same direction. And I thought that'd be stupid if I did. So he said, I went to my high school teacher, who was a Christian woman, and I told her about this, and how could I keep from going in that direction? Well, she said, I could tell you, but there's a man that's my pastor could tell you better. So the next day, she took him to her pastor, and her pastor began to explain to him how he was lost, and he was separated from God, alienated from the commonwealth of God, and that Christ had come to reconcile him unto the Father, had come to die for him, so that God, as a moral governor of the universe, could be just in forgiving him his sin because now he had a substitute for the penalty of the crime that would uphold the honor of the law and have the same effect upon the law that the execution of the penalty upon the lawbreaker would have if he had to repent of his sins and trust Christ. My friend, Professor Robert Brown, there is a lad, a junior in high school, repented of his sins after several meetings with his pastor, and passed from death unto life, was born again. Well, when he got out of high school, he worked his way to Brooklyn, New York, and went to school there and then enrolled in a seminary there. Worked his way through the seminary. When he graduated, he worked his way back 
and hitchhiked back to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and went around to the various Anglo churches out there and wanted to be hired as a youth pastor. He's a seminary graduate. That's a natural thing. None of them would hire him because he was half Anglo, half Mexican. Just what the doctor ordered for a town like that. They wouldn't hire him, so he heard about a little storefront Baptist church in Santa Fe, which is about 80 miles away. He hitchhiked up there, and he got a hold of the deacons, and he applied for the job as president, or as pastor, of this small storefront mission type of a church. They hired him. They gave him the parsonage. That was a cot in the back room. Well, he got busy. He began to walk all over Santa Fe, New Mexico. And a couple years later, I met him. Now he had built up the nicest, almost the biggest church in town, had a brand new building of territorial design, beautiful, and they had the World Missionary Conference in there, and they had missionaries, I think, from 23 or 26 countries. Now, he had never heard much, especially in seminary, about foreign missions. And during this time, while he's pastor there, he went out to the state penitentiary in Santa Fe, and he asked out there the warden if he needed someone to come in and be a chaplain and try to help these fellows. And he said, I certainly do. And so he did that for seven years, and he tried to get the other preachers around town to help him, and not a one would help him. Well, while I was there preaching on missions in this, I was the main speaker in this big conference, I spoke once on faith giving during that conference. I told them that faith giving was, to me, not giving the money you have, that, that's just obedience. But faith giving is when you reach out and you trust God to give great sums of money and you're willing to work hard to do it. And you must trust God for it and you're putting your faith in him that he'll enable you to do it. So he made a big missionary pledge on a Sunday night. By the way, by this time he's married and he had four children. And if you know Baptist churches, they do not overpay their preachers. Well... He made this pledge, and about one month later, the state of New Mexico decided to buy, build a new penitentiary there in town. Now they've got to get a chaplain, at least to work half time, and the warden called him in and said, now, Reverend Brown, I've got to advertise this job as it's up now and they can bid for it or I've got to advertise it. You can have the job if you want to, but I'll, I'll put it up the way I should. I'll advertise it anyway. And how many of you think applied for that job then, now that there's money in it? I'm ashamed to tell you. I'm ashamed to tell you. Well, he got the job, and that was twice what his missionary pledge was. Twice what his missionary pledge was. Well, I began to send him other books on missions and not just things I, I was interested in, books by Oswald Smith, other men who got a heart for God and getting the world evangelized. And about two years later, he called the deacons together in that church and he resigned that church. And he went down to Guadalajara, Mexico, and he worked with Catholic priests leaving the priesthood. They'd come to him and they knew that he could lead men to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, and many of them found the Savior. But also, he would leave and go out three weeks out of the month, out in the most backward parts. He'd go by horse a whole week. He'd go as far as he could by public conveyance, and then a horse for a week, and then he would evangelize for another week or so, and then go back. And by the way, sometimes he had to ford real deep and, and very fast rivers. Well, right today, Professor Robert Brown has over 30 churches going among the Huichol Indians, thousands of converts out there, and now 
they are going to other parts of Mexico with the mission, and they're in message that Jesus Christ died for their sins according to the scriptures, was crucified, buried, and rose again. Now that's because a young man decided that he didn't want to go to a penitentiary. He didn't want that life of sin. He wanted a way out, and thank God he had a godly teacher. And that came right out of his will. Certainly, I'm sure uh, uh, people are praying for him. But he had to decide. God will not grab a man by the nap of the neck and make him become a Christian. I would shudder to think where that good man would be today if it wasn't for this fact we're talking about here, the incipiency of the will. This is so important in every day of life, not just in missionary work. I'll give you an example. I was lecturing at a college in California, and I had a nephew then, a professor at UCLA. This is about the year of 1967. I may be one or two years off either way. So I went up to his house in I forget the name of that suburb where UCLA is in, for dinner. And a brother-in-law of his, who was a, the number two man in the medical part of the lunar space deal, Dr. Crampton Finn, and he was Dr. Jack Bormuth. And we got to talking about what I was teaching. And I was teaching in this college down there. And I'm teaching about the incipiency of the will and how it gets over in the mental problems. And then I told them what I was doing. He said, well, you sound like William Glasser. William Glasser was a psychologist out there that worked for the state, had worked in a, in a place in Ventura for a school for girls, a penal type school. But also, he had come up with what he called reality therapy. And there are three R's to it, three R's to mental health. Reality, responsibility, and right. Now, they let him, he had such great success in the Ventura Girls School, they let him come down to Los Angeles, gave him 200 men in a Veterans Administration ward that had been there an average of 15 years, and only one would leave a year as cured by the Freudian approach. He started teaching them to face reality, the situations of life as they really are. Not as they used to be, the way you want them to be, but the way they are right now with you and your life and the surrounding situation. Then he taught them the responsibilities of life, that responsibilities have sanctions connected with them. That if you fulfill your responsibilities, you get the good consequences. If you don't, then you'll suffer the penalties for disobedience of not fulfilling your responsibilities in life. And if you do what is right, you'll be right. That's remarkably simple, isn't it? He taught that now to these 200 men in this Veterans Administration mental ward, and the first year, 74 left is cured. Only two of those ever came back. Now, that's a very good record on recidivism, isn't it? Well, I had been teaching this same thing, only I didn't call it the same thing that he did. And he gave me all of Dr. Glasser's papers because he had been in these seminars and he taught psychology also, my own nephew. He just retired from the PhD program recently from the University of Chicago. He's now a Christian, a very fine Christian man. I'm speaking of Dr. Jack Bormuth. Well, now, what was he doing? He's telling these men, if you exercise your will to do what's right, you're going to be right. Now, if you brought someone, say, a son or a daughter, a nephew, to him that was performing or having certain aberrations in their life, things departing from the norm, to him, like for instance, one young lady I know that wherever she'd go, she always carried big stuffed toys, 18 years old. Wouldn't go anywhere without big stuffed toys. My friends, that's an aberration. 
That's not normal. Well, he would teach you. If you came and you said, now I have a son that's acting up here like this and he's crazy, or he's mentally ill. He'd say, no, he's not mentally ill. Well, what is he then? He said, he's crazy. See, he makes a difference between a person being crazy and one being mentally ill. First place, he doesn't believe in mental illness, and I don't either. So he would say, the reason they're crazy is they're doing crazy things. And the reason they're doing crazy things is this simple. God created man that man must, he must run on something like an automobile runs on gasoline and oil. Man is to run and function on love. And he has two big needs in his life, and he doesn't, if he doesn't get those needs fulfilled in a normal way, he'll go out and fulfill them in an abnormal way, and then we will say he's mentally ill. Now, he says he's crazy. Now, friends, the difference between an illness, otherwise, saying someone is mentally ill and saying he's crazy, there's a big difference. And the reason I say this to you, that there is no such thing as a mental illness, unless you're talking about a chemical imbalance, and then that won't make up 3% of the people that have mental problems. And according to Dr. Tory of the government, he says we can take a layman three days training and, tell him how, and teach him how to tell if it is a chemical imbalance. So that's, that's not a major factor in this. But the way to tell a difference between a weakness and an illness is this. An illness always has a dysfunction, a malfunction of something in the human body. A misfunction, a dysfunction, something isn't working right. Otherwise, it's physical. It's a physical thing. And I realize that there are some sorts of diseases that we have nice little words for them that I don't want to use the words. And uh, you could say psychosomatic in some of them. But he is saying then, if you act right, you'll be right. Now, if you've got somebody around you that's beginning to act strange, the way for you to help them is, now I said to you that man is created to love his fellow man, to love God, and to be loved. If you've got a loved one that's beginning to act a little strange, then you give them an extra amount of love. I've seen this work, my friends, so many times I can't even remember the number of times. Go out of your way to be kind and gracious and gentle and tender to them. Now, if while you're showing love to that other person, you're fulfilling a need in your own life. The reason God demands that we love one another is we run on love. That is what we give out and that is what we get. If they don't want to pay attention to our overtures of love and care and kindness, at least we're going to be right ourselves, even if they don't want it. And so when we go and we show them love and kindness, you'll find they'll begin to straighten out if you help them and take them out of this position of stress. Now. A weakness, if you, you can take something that is weak and teach it and train it so it can cope with its existing and surrounding stresses so it can cope with those. And many times that is a mental job to do this. Now, I was having lunch one day with our company shrink, psychologist, or if you want to say psychiatrist. And I was putting it on the board, and I want to show it to you the way I put it on the board with him. On a napkin at the airport, if you will, please. I said, now, I will not argue whether it's mental problems are sicknesses or weaknesses. But I know there can be an organic, genic thing, chemical imbalance. I know that. But, oh, how about... How about somebody over here is doing terrible and mean things to us? We used to sing a song when I was a young man. 
you're driving me crazy. Well, don't you ever think that can't be done? It is possible. I can tell you things happened during the war that men intentionally drove other men mentally in a position where they're incompetent. So, this can be sins against us. But over here now, here can be our sin. Otherwise, we reap the consequences of our choices. If they're bad choices, we'll, we'll reap guilt. One thing I agree with Sigmund Freud is man's biggest problem is guilt. And the reason it's his big, he is guilty, the reason he has this guilt complex is because he's guilty. He has mistreated his fellow man, and he's done the same thing to God. And God has never designed man to be in home in sin. The Bible says there is no peace to the wicked for the very simple reason we're not created to live like that. All right, now let's go a little further. Up here can be knowledge, and there have been. I know this by experience, friends. And once I even had some fellows one time, very jealous of what I was doing. I had I was a distinct impression they were trying to drive me crazy. So I'll tell you what I did. I just read my Bible a little more, and I loved those people a little more than I had been. And I was not bitter about it. I never even acted like I knew about it. And I got back into studying some things about the suke, the soul. And I came up this, and with the knowledge that I had of my own, and I didn't have an organic genetic thing here, a chemical imbalance. So the problem was this, sins against me. Now, I was going through this with Dr. William Gould, who's now deceased. I put it on this piece of paper, and he says, I agree with you, Con, 100%, and I'll give you an example of it. He said, you know, I'm also a psychiatrist for the, for the Sterling Rock Falls school system in Illinois. Sterling Rock Falls. Between the two of them, about 40,000 people. He said, we have a girl in an elementary school that had school phobia. Do you know what school phobia is? She's afraid to go to school. Afraid. So when they'd make her go to school, she just became a little stark raven, screaming, a little psychotic. So this one day, she didn't show up. They called me. I told them to call me. So I went to school to see her. I sat down with this 10-year-old, precious little girl. I said, now, you're afraid of something, aren't you? She said, yes, I'm afraid of something here because he'd got her to go to school with him. He said, are you afraid the ceiling's going to fall on you? She said, oh, no. It's a nice new building. Afraid the wall's going to fall? Oh, no, no. Are you afraid of the teacher? No. She's wonderful. Are you afraid of the other students? No. The students here are my friends. They're wonderful. She said, what are you afraid of? Well, I'm going to back up a little bit. Before he did this, he called her mother and father to come to school, and her mother came, but her dad wouldn't come. So he called him and said, now, mister, you get here right now, or I'm going to send a sheriff to get you. I'll sign a warrant to get you to come here. So now he's quizzing her in front of them. Well, are you afraid of the teacher? No. Afraid of the students? No. Afraid of the fault? No. What is it you're afraid of? She said, him? She pointed at her father. Why are you afraid of him? She said, he came and got me at school once and took me home and he hurt me. Incest. He hurt me. So when her mother said to her in the morning, you've got to go to school today, bang, she, that just set her off right now, triggered her. She became a little stark raven, screaming, a little psychotic because sin against her. 
Is it any wonder God demands that we love one another? Any wonder? That's one of the great and terrible things of all this child abuse that we have around. It, it hurts a child, but it's going to hurt also the man that's doing it. He'll have that. Maybe the, the daughter will get over it in time, but he never will get over it until he finds forgiveness, and then he'll have guilt the rest of his life over it. See, he chose to do that. That man chose to do that. This little girl didn't choose. So, is it any wonder then that God insists, he insists that we love one another? He, as a moral governor of the universe, God has the best interest of every one of us at heart. And that's why he, he gave us the Ten Commandments. The first four between ourselves and God, and the last six horizontal between one another, because we deserve to be treated right. We're to love one another. And he would be unrighteous if he didn't demand that. Now, what would you think of me if I designed a big, complicated machine tool? Our firms made them a a sell from about $200,000 up to a million, $300,000, computer control, CNC, numerical control, along with it. Well, there's a thick manual that comes about that thick with it. Why do you think we send them that manual? The reason that we do is so they can get the most out of that investment, so they won't hurt themselves, so they won't hurt the machine, uh, and so they can serve their customers in a better way and so their company can grow and be more profitable and we'd be terribly remiss if we didn't have that kind of a manual for them. Well, let's say I design an automobile. Wouldn't I be very remiss if I didn't insist, now this car that I've designed, it must have oil in the crankcase, it must have gasoline in the tank, I don't know if your wife drives or not, but it seems to me every time I get my wife's car, she thinks it runs on fumes. First thing I do is look to see if it's got any gasoline in it. And I usually start for a filling station. That's where I go first. Well, being an engineer, I realize that that car is designed in such a certain way, and they have maintenance manuals for our good, we the people that own them, and for the other people on the roads. And God has given us a great psychological or psychology manual. It's the only book of preventative psychology ever written in this world worth more than a paper's printed on, and that is the Holy Bible. That is the Holy Bible. Love one another. Otherwise, because he designed man to run on love. But a lot of people love their sin. Now, I had a daughter named Nancy. Still have her. Precious girl, precious woman. I have two daughters. What would you think of when she's about five years old, she goes over in the corner of our living room, she takes some papers and some matches, she gets a fire started. And I see it coming up. I go over and I stamp that fire out. And I say, no, Nancy, don't do that. You're allowed to burn the house down. Oh, okay, Daddy. Well, about an hour, I look, there she's got another one going. <laughs> well, she not only might burn our house down, but burn all the other houses down in our neighborhood. I owe it to my neighbors. I owe it to my little daughter. I owe it to the other daughter. I owe it to my wife to insist that she stop doing that because that's going to hurt herself, it's going to hurt the neighbors, it's going to hurt her brothers and sisters, and that's why God gave us the Ten Commandments. So we won't keep on hurting them and hurting ourselves. The greatest book of preventative psychology, and listen to this, the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And you know how it goes on from there. He restoreth my soul. And that word soul there is just what we're talking about. He restoreth our soul. How? By leading us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Otherwise, get us to behave ourselves. Get us to live intelligently. 
and so that the incipiency of the will, that we might choose to do what's right, what's reasonable. This is why, my friends, my last lect two lectures were on moral government, and the previous four before that were on moral government. What I can say to you is, I know the way God has created man, that he's been made in his image, and God has a will, and he put a will in the man. God has an intellect, and he put an intellect in the man. God has sensibilities, he put sensibilities in the man. But some people, they want to make God in their own image, and they say, oh no, God is impossible impassable or impassive, which means God cannot experience emotional highs or lows. But yet the Bible says, who are we going to believe? Some theologian? Are we going to believe when God says I, to Israel, I'm broken at your horse hearts? That he's sad. And when he says to us that obey him and love him, I'll sing over you. I'll delight over you. I will joy over you. I believe our God is, is not impassive. He has the ability to experience, and that's why we have the ability to experience, because we're made in the image of God, and through the incipiency of the will, we can choose to do what is right, or we can choose to do what is wrong, but when we get the sense that God intended for us to have, we start to choose what is right to please God, and now because we're not a rebel anymore and we put an equal value and appreciation upon our fellow man, we're not going to hurt our fellow man. And I can tell you this, friends, this works wherever it is tried. This same man I was talking about, Dr. Bill Gould, and during his internship, he did it at Elgin State Hospital in Elgin, Illinois, 43 miles from where I live told me, he said, Harry, I had one ward with 200 men. They were sitting in there like this, looking off into space, off into fantasy land. If you will, bye-bye land. They're escaping reality, and they're in there because they wanted to escape responsibility. He said, we'd ring the fire bell. This is only about once a year. We'd ring the fire bell, and they'd get up, and they would run out of there, run outside the building, because we had the door open by then, and they'd look around, there's no fire, and there's no fence then, they could keep on going if they want. No, 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 they'd turn right around and line up right in front of the door. They wanted back in because there's no responsibility in there. You could hide from reality in there. Now, he said to me, let's analyze what happened. He said, these men, you could come up to them and be looking out there and you could run your hand in front of them like this and wouldn't even bat an eye, wouldn't even know it was there. He said, they're escaping reality, out in fantasy land. When we rang the fire bell, they could reason, there's a fire. I may die in a fire. So their motive to live was greater than their motive to escape reality and responsibility, so they ran out of the building. I submit to you, they are not mentally ill. <laughs> They're irresponsible, is what they were. I had a man that called me when I was in a staff meeting, talked to my secretary and said, please tell Mr. Khan I won't be in anymore. I'm going to have myself committed to Elgin State Hospital. I got up and left the meeting said to her, please call him and ask him not to go there until he comes in to see me. Ask him if he'll do me that favor. So about two o'clock, he came into my office. Big, tall, husky fellow. Since owned a professional football team. And I talked to him, I said, well, I said, you want to go to Elgin, huh? Is the heat from your mother-in-law getting too hot now? He said, yes. I said, you want to go in there and hide, don't you? He said, yes, from responsibilities. I said, I don't think you're a deadbeat, but every year you're in there, your, your debts are going to grow 7% compounded every year. I think you don't intend to spend the rest of your life in there, do you? No. Well, your debts will be 7% per year compounded. 
And I said, you got several fine boys. And I said, there's certain attributes they'll get from you they can't get from their mother. Now, if you want to be raising a couple of little lilies, you go on in there. But I said, you really want me to tell you what's wrong with you? Two things. I said, you've got a champagne taste and a Coca-Cola effort in your job. I said, you're a well-educated man, but you don't want to work. I know your mother-in-law has you has just ruined your morale. But I said, you ought to go home and sit down with her. And his mother-in-law is a wealthy woman. She didn't like the way that he was taking care of her daughter and her grandchildren. And I say, said to him, now, I'd go and sit down and take a nice, serious talk with her. Say, look, as from right now, I'm doing the best I can. Now, if you don't like the best that I'm doing, you give me the money. You've got plenty of it, and I'll live just the way you want me to live. Either that or you keep still. I said, well, that's part of it. I won't do it all. But then I said, you want to tell me about your sin? He said, how'd you know? I said, I knew something was really bothering you. He said, I just don't know how you knew. I told him, I said, well, you're getting the consequence of your sin. Here's real depression. You're in depression. You want to go in there and hide. And now you've got guilt on top of it. Oh, that's a terrible con uh, combination. And I said, you're beginning to reap the consequences of it. And unless you repent of this, you will go in there and you may never get out because guilt and depression a uh, pretty wicked combination. And I said, but it's up to you. You don't need to go in there. And then I began to teach him this way, that whenever you choose an act, you're also choosing the consequences and separately connected with that act. If you choose to do what's good and right and proper, you'll get the good consequences. You'll get the rewards. Now, if you do what's stupid and selfish and sinful, and disobedient, then you'll get to penalties. Now, which do you want out of life? This is why Moses stood out there in that Judean hillside and said to the Israelites, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, won't you choose life that both thou and thy seed may live? He was laying it right before the Israelites. They, they could get out of this life what they wanted. If you choose to obey, and he says that so many times in the scriptures, he must have gotten tired of doing that. But God is long-suffering. Now, that man, I've gotten many and many and many a Christmas card from that man. He'd say, eternally grateful, Harry. Thank you very much. Eternally grateful. Never went to a mental institution. He straightened out. He shouldered responsibilities in life. He chose to do what is right, and he began to feel right. Because the incipiency of the will, that man being made in the image of God can originate his own actions apart from any outside or inside influence. You know, there's an example of that in Luke 6. I mean, Mark 6, 6. Here's Jesus goes back to his hometown to preach. Back to Nazareth. Jesus had four half-brothers, two half-sisters. They're in the Douay version. They're in all the Protestant versions. Their names are James, Joseph, Jude, and Simon. And the two sisters' names are there. Now, it says they were offended at him. They didn't, they didn't trust Christ as the Messiah. They didn't go along with him. And it says in Mark 6, 6, Jesus marveled at her unbelief. He marveled at her unbelief. Well, what was there to marvel at? Here's what there was to marvel at. If it's all determined, if it's all as men like B.F. Skinner say, <laughs> that you don't have a free will and you're conditioned to do everything that you do, that you never have original idea of your life but your environment conditioned you, oh, I can tell you when B.F. Skinner had an original idea, when he graduated in Hamilton College and went out and tried to be right for a living, he only made 40 cents an hour, some hours. He said, oh, I got to eat better than this. So he made a decision. He's going back to school. He went to Harvard, and he got a master's in psychology. He became a determinist in psychology, which wasn't new with him. 
you know, there was a man over in Russia that had these experiments with the dogs. You, you all know who I'm talking about. He'd ring the bell. Dogs would begin to slobber, you know. He'd condition them to do this. But when you read his papers, he said, there were some dogs that resisted conditioning. He could not condition them. They would run away or they would just not, they'd rebel against what he was teaching them. Well, that happened to me. I lived out on Long Island, but my boy one day, a beautiful dog took him home. He was about that big, cutest thing you ever saw. My wife started to get him housebroken. When he did what he shouldn't, he'd take a newspaper and whack him around with it. She'd roll it up. Well, he wanted to live like a dog, and in the depths of the winter, he ran away. We couldn't condition him. We couldn't condition him. Well, this man was honest enough to say many of his dogs, he couldn't condition them either. You can find that in a book written by a man named Albert Hobbs called A Book on the Will, professor to University of P Pennsylvania, both their top professor there many, many years. The name of the book is Man is Moral Choice. Now, it's that thick, and the whole book was written to expose the false, the misinformation that we're putting out on college campuses to young people that are destroying their lives and their careers. Now, what I'm saying here is the Bible has the answers to these things, but some of us just don't seem to think it has any relevancy to today's living, but I'm here to tell you that it does. I can tell you of a word in a hospital in Boston, the Boston Psychiatric Hospital. They took 100 college kids that only averaged two years of college education, taught them what I'm talking about here tonight, taught them to care, taught them to go in there and show these patients, give each one of them, three of them, three patients, got to know them, became their friend, got them to write home to their parents. After a couple of weeks of calling them two or three times a week, took them downtown in Boston to do some shopping. Began to teach them reality, to face situations of life as they really are. Then responsibilities of life have consequences connected with them. And if they do what's right, they'll be right. So if you fulfill your responsibilities, there's whole wards in there now, closed up, all the beds folded up and pushed right back in the end of the building with not a thing in them because 100 college kids went in there, showed them love, and showed them that there's no such thing here as mental illness. It's a weakness. See, a weakness, you can take that member that is weak and teach it and train it so it can e cope with its existing and surrounding stresses so it can cope with this no longer weak and wasn't sick in the first place. Wasn't sick in the first place. Well, this seems maybe too revolutionary for some of you, but if you get the books written by Dr. Sass, head of the School of Psychiatry at University of Syracuse, he has books called The Myth of Mental Illness. He has about seven books on this to show you. I was looking for one of them one time in a library. I'm lecturing in Omaha and I'm in a library of Creighton University. And I said, I'd like to find some of the books here of Dr. Sass. Oh, he's a pariah here, Dr. Sass is. <laughs> because he'll make you know that you're not sick. You're not sick. You've got a weakness, and he'll show you how to conquer the weakness and strengthen that. Even the t teachers, I mean, even the students knew it was real. But you see, you can't make a lot of money teaching this kind of psychology. And you can get your patients to become well. And I don't mean that as an antidote to being sick. I mean that they can go out and cope with everyday stresses of life. Now, there's many, many illustrations of this that I could give you because of the incipiency of the human will that it, being made in the image of God, 
we can make the right choices. The reason Jesus marveled, he said, look at their heredity, Joseph and Mary. Where could the brothers and sisters of Jesus ever gotten a better heredity than that? The best since Adam and Eve. Where could they have gotten a better environment? Raised in the home of Joseph and Mary and Jesus. As close to perfect environment as, as would be possible in this world. And then training. Jesus would have sinned if he hadn't taught his own brothers and sisters. When there is an obligation that comes with having truth, and that's to pass it on. Ah, but they had seen him get a little persecution around town. They had seen him when he stood up the first time in a local synagogue to preach. And when he finished, they took him out and tried to kill him. See, most people want enough religion to get to heaven, but not enough to change their lifestyle. And when somebody does come along that takes their relationship very, very serious with God, then the lackadaisical ones and lukewarm ones, they think that they've got to tear them down. This goes on all the time. But Jesus suffered in, in a terrible way there from his own half-brothers and own half-sisters. Now, he marveled. He knew this. They might have a thousand reasons for rejecting him, but none that were valid. They may have a thousand reasons, but not one causation. Because when we say you can cause a man to do this, no, you cannot cause a moral act. You can influence a moral act. But an influence you can say no to, or you can say yes to. Well, I had a sister, older than myself, the the only sister I had and my dad could never do much with. And she began, after she married a while, about 15 years, she began to have mental problems. Started to go into picture shows from 1 o'clock till 9 o'clock at night, escaping reality. She would even hock their furniture to get money to go set in a picture show and set through three different ones. Well, her husband got sick and tired of this. He was a wonderful man. Not a person in our family ever blamed him for divorcing her. Because he had, he had washed the diapers, he changed the babies, he washed the dishes, he cooked. She's sitting in a movie somewhere. Well, she has herself, after he divorced her, she begins to fall apart. She has herself committed to Logan Sports State Hospital in Logan Sport, Indiana, with, with mental problems. I was teaching at Purdue University for a week. One of those mornings, I finished by about 10.30, and I drove up there about 50 miles to Logansport, Indiana State Hospital, and went, took me a half hour to find her. I sat there and talked to her the way I'm talking to you people, and taught her that she's designed to live on love. She needed love, and when she loved the other people, it's fulfilling need in her life when I love her. And I gave her a copy of William Glasser's book, Reality Therapy. I said, now I want you to read this, Mary. I want you to send it back to me, or you write to me, and I want you to give me his, ad, his outline here for, for being right mentally. In less than one week, she wrote me a letter. She said, Harry, I see it. If I will face reality, the situation here and in my life, and my responsibilities, and assume and fulfill my responsibilities and do what is right, I'll be right. She asked for a sanity test because she had put herself in there voluntarily. They gave her a sanity test and they declared her <laughs> mentally competent. She left there. She never was in another mental institution the rest of her life. I was lecturing about three or four years later for the yearly meeting of the Numerical Control Society and a fabricator in a society in Phoenix, Arizona. When I got off the plane, they met me at this little entourage and said, Mr. Khan, we want to show you all over uh, Phoenix today. I said, I want to thank you very much, gentlemen, but, I, but I've got a sister that lives here, and uh, she's in a nursing home. She's physically not well. I pray they have me excused. I thank you for your kindness to me. I went and found her. 
we took the longest walk and she said to me, oh Harry, I'm listening to church programs on Sunday. I'm reading my Bible every day and Jesus is so real. He's so near. He's so dear to me. He's so wonderful to me. And I found that our mother, the longer I live like this, the smarter my mother gets. <laughs> How thankful I am for that dear godly mother. And yet I can, you know, for years she had nothing good to say about her godly mother. I used to take her to task about that sometimes too. But you see, when she got straightened out on the great things of life, but she made the decision, I will, I will face reality. I will assume and fulfill my responsibilities. I will act right, and then I will be right. And bless her heart, she blessed my heart that much. I got so blessed that afternoon it's, those men were very, very lucky. It's 1975. I know the exact night. That was the night that Carlton Fisk hit the home run and hit the pole in the World Series against Cincinnati. I thought, that's nothing. Look what God's done for my sister. But it was giving her the truth. The truth is incipiency of the will. You see, when Finney and Jonathan Edwards and those people came on the scene in New England, New England theology up to that point was very hyper-Calvinistic. A man just sat there waiting to be elected. He said, no, no. Finney talked to them like old Job talked to the people back there. And Sodom and Gomorrah, get you up and get you out of this place. Otherwise, an act of the will, you can make a move toward God. And you come to God, he's not willing that any should perish, and come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Yes, mental rest, because he's got lots of it within his loving arms, and in cheerful submission to him, he can speak peace to every troubled soul that there is in this world. If just somebody would teach him how right and how reasonable, how wonderful the blessed gospel is. Thank you very much.